this international discussion. And you can go throughout the diaspora and find people as well. Mm -hmm. So uh, I think it's overdue and we need to move in that direction. Okay, thank you so much, uh, Mr. Mobley, uh, for that. Uh, uh, coming back to you, uh, Mr. Elijah Inoku, uh, after listening to all of the uh, preliminary uh, statements from this uh, panel of experts, now uh, this question uh, will be directed to you. Uh, uh, in your opinion or in your perspective, what uh, should uh, or what measures should the African governments take to strengthen uh, their uh, diplomatic and uh, negotiation uh, capacities uh, to effectively participate in uh, this uh, global decision making? Yeah, Clarice, I started by saying that the devil is in the details. And let's talk a little bit of details here because that's actually where the issue is going to lie. That is where I'm going to see the sincerity of the G20, including members of the BRICS. Because my colleague, uh, Mr. Arthur, talked about the BRICS. I'm very happy with what the BRICS is trying to do, yeah. but I need concrete action on the table. Jane talked about transfer of technology. I agree with her 100%. But here is the problem, which I want to see before I will agree that the G20 are actually serious and taking Africa seriously. When it comes to the transfer of technology, when the Africa ICT committee sit and ask for member states of the G20 to deal with Africa in terms of transferring the technology that they are currently using in Africa, transferring their intellectual, part of the intellectual property right. Will they agree? That's what I want to see. China, for example, is a member of the BRICS. And China is the greatest trading partner of, with Africa now in terms of member states. It's China, way beyond any other country. They're, there's no competitor right now. But when it comes to transfer of technology, Jane and the rest of the panelists, China is having a trade deficit of 47 billion with Africa. A trade deficit. We are talking about a country that is actually, ex, I mean, gaining from the resources of Africa and leaving no traces behind. So this is where we talked about devil being in the details. Yeah, they will make photo up, but when it comes to actually doing something, we are going to see, I hope, let me not be negative here, I hope we are going to see progress. Number two, the current fever and enthusiasm in Africa is the fact that some African leaders those that are very progressive in nature, they are clamoring for transformation of natural resources on the continent of Africa before being shipped abroad. Paul Kagame has come out and declared that the African Union should come up with a preamble that they're going to present to the G20, United Nations, and all the other bodies and say, no natural product should leave the continent of Africa without being transformed into at least a semi finished product. Finish proof, yeah. Do you think, all of you listening to me, do you think the G20 are going to agree to this? Because that's a huge trade imbalance right there. That's a huge trade imbalance. Take example, just a simple thing like cocoa. You know, those cocoa beans. It doesn't take much to transform cocoa into chocolate. But we don't see that happen on the continent of Africa because G20 and the Western nations are not yet ready to relinquish that economic advantage that they gain from just buying the raw products and transforming them in the Western world and then selling it by almost 1,000 percent times to the African states. Are they ready to come to the table when it comes to negotiation in this area? Number three, concessions. We are talking about the IMF. If you look at the loans, I mentioned this before. If you look at the loans that the African states are taking from the IMF, the World Bank, the British Woods Institutions, and all the other ones. It is killing Africa because they are taking those loans at about 10, 15, 20 percent, and then the Western world take the same loan at about 0.1 percent. Therefore, the African states spend all their time servicing debt, not paying the debt, servicing the debt. The African Union and the African Financial Committee, they are clamoring for what we call 
concessional loans, that is to say, the resources of Africa should act as a backup, or you can call it collateral security, for any loan that Africa is going to get. Are the G20 ready to go along with that? That is what I say, the devil is always in the details. These people, I do not see them at the stage, because that is where it's going to pinch them. And that's what Africa is going to get. Are they ready for that? Now, you talk about mineral resources. Um, my colleague, Arthur Mobley, talked about the mineral resources for Africa. Mm -hmm. That is an area where it's going to take up even 10 of these uh, debates to talk about what Africa is losing in terms of its mineral resources. Sure. If you think about the metals and the minerals that are needed in the world right now in terms of, and, you know, the whole world is talking about renewable energy and climate change and everything that it needs to put in place, whether you're talking about adaptation or mitigation or whatever it is, I am telling you that Africa has everything. 60% of the renewable resources are in Africa that are needed to implement this, this action. If you listen to the president of Kenya, William Roto, mm -hmm. on the climate uh, uh, conference that just ended in Nairobi, you will understand the stakes in Africa. He came up and said, look, we are not the polluters. We have everything to help the polluters in the world put, you know, bring down this climate, whatever it is that's happening in the world. Are they ready to give us the money to implement mitigation or adaptation policy into place that will help the global? Because if the world is warming by 1% in North America, it's also warming by 1% in Africa, it's warming by 1% all over the world. So it's a global problem. Are they willing to give them the money to implement these strategies so that they can help the rest of the world? You see, they're dragging their feet. So when I say the devil is in the details, look at the COVID-19 vaccine, for example. Mm -hmm. When that happened, the vaccine was developed in the Western world without a problem. I'm not going to the politics of it. I'm talking about the economics of it. Let's leave the politics of it altogether. I'm talking about the economics of it. When it was discovered, African countries said, we have a country like South Africa and Egypt and some of the advanced African countries. They said, we have the technology, technology to develop this vaccine, I mean, to manufacture this vaccine locally, transfer the intellectual property right to us, let us manufacture it uh, locally. You saw what happened. The international community, they were not ready to relinquish the technology to, that will allow African countries to produce that same vaccine that they are producing here. So when I say the devil is in the details, if this is what is hampering Africa and these people, I am not sure that they are willing to let go of some of the benefits that they are having from Africa. Until we see concrete action, then we will know they are coming to the table with good faith. I am not going to be negative here. Let's not. hope. Let's hope that that's going to be the the, uh, the way going forward. But again, Absolutely. to answer your question. We are still far from seeing concrete action, Clarice. We are still far from there. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, it is uh, the uh, primary stage. And of course, uh, uh, the essence of a debate like this is to uh, bring out uh, insight on how the stakeholders... Clarice, the microphone yeah? is off. We can't hear you. Thank you so much uh, for that, uh, Mr. Elijah in our core. Of course, we're saying uh, uh, that, of course, is still at the preliminary stage. But uh, the, 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 the reason for a debate like this is to see how we can bring insightful uh, uh, debate